Hey everybody, how are you doing today? So today we're going to go over surface anatomy in the body and what the anatomical terms are that we use to describe different regions of your body or a patient's body. It's really important to get these terms down and become familiar with them because they're going to be useful to us later on when we're understanding more complex systems. For example, if I know that uh, the kind of anterior side of my thigh here is called femoral, then I also have a pretty good idea that the major artery that's running through that region is the femoral artery. So the terms are going to become useful as we move on through the semester. Now these terms are specifically for surface anatomy. So different parts that I can see on the surface of a person's body and identify using some anatomical term. Now in your outcomes and objectives in this module, you'll see a list and I would recommend printing off that list or at least keeping it handy and using that as your reference point. Now on that list there are common terms for the different regions. For example, if you notice here in parentheses we have ear, nose, mouth, and so on. I don't want you to give me those terms. I know you know what they are. I want you to be using the anatomical terms for those different structures, which would be the ones that are not in parentheses, like otic for ear, nasal for nose, and so on. It really just takes some time to go through and memorize. Now you can use the picture here that you have in your textbook, or you can honestly print off a picture of anybody that you want to look at and identify those different structures. If you have kids, this is a fun game. You can kind of have to tickle fights with them and identify the different parts when you're tickling their knee, you're tick tickling the patella region, and so on, just to kind of help reinforce it. So let's do a quick rundown of the different terms, and then I'll show you how you can apply this to some pictures of real people. So first of all, um, when we're looking at terms, if you've had medical terminology, you know that sometimes there's a difference between how we say a word if it's a noun or if it's an adjective. And in general, if it ends in AL, IC, um, LY, for example, those are good examples of adjectives or uh, suffixes, ends of words, that make that word an adjective. So, for example, a chromial region is the point of your shoulder, or we can call it the acromion. So if it doesn't end in one of these, it's often a noun. I don't really care which one you use when you're describing or identifying a structure on a test. Um, from the people that I've talked to in the medical field, I, in particular, I talked to the head of our uh, physical therapy ass um, assistant program, and he said, in general, they typically use adjectives more than nouns. So let's start from the top and work our way down. So the entire head is cephalic. Your forehead is frontal. Your eye is orbital nasal, oral, your ear is otic, so you would put otic solutions in your ear, your cheek is buccal or buccal. I like calling it buccal and here's a really stupid way of remembering this. I always just think that my cheek is buccal. That reminds me of the muscle in there deep in the cheek which is called the buccinator. Buccinators make me think of buccaneers, buccaneers make me think of pirates, and pirates make me think of Johnny Depp, and Johnny Depp makes me smile. So that helps me remember buckle. I know that's kind of a long way around, but I'm willing to bet you that some of you someday will just remember that this is Johnny Depp and you won't know why. So oral is your mouth. Your chin is mental. Now, that seems like kind of an odd one, but if you just think of the thinking man, he's holding his chin, so you just think, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm being mental here, right? Now, once you know this is mental, when we're learning the skull, you'll find a couple of holes in the front of the chin, and holes in the skull typically allow blood vessels or nerves to pass through, and those holes are called the mental foramen, and foramen means hole. Your neck is cervical, so think putting a cervical collar on somebody uh, who has whiplash, for example. Your kind of breastbone right in the center here is sternal. 
Your overall chest is thoracic. That's not on this picture, but it is on your list. Um, the breasts are mammary. Your armpit is axillary, not auxiliary, so you want to make sure you spell things correctly. So it's axillary or it's your axilla. You put deodorant on the axilla. The point of your shoulder we mentioned before is acromial or the acromion. Your upper arm is brachial. Your lower arm is anti-brachial. Notice it's spelled with an E, anti-brachial, not, an, not with an I. If I am anti-brachial, that means I'm against it, so it's not that. So brachial, upper arm, anti-brachial, lower arm. Inside of the elbow is anti-cubital. Very important vein, the median cubital vein runs right through there. Important for clinical reasons for drawing blood. The back of my elbow is the olecranon or olecranol. They call it cubital in this picture, but either one is acceptable. I like olecranol or olecranon because that is the olecranon process on your ulna, and then you've already learned some of your surface anatomy for bones. So that's the back of the elbow and the inside of the elbow. Your wrist, if you have a sore wrist, you might have carpal tunnel syndrome. So these are your carpal bones are in your wrist. So carpal. Your whole hand is the manus or manual. Just think I'm doing manual labor with my hands. I actually don't have that one on this picture, so we'll write that one down here, manual. Your fingers are digits or digital, or you can call them phalanges because all of the bones that make up your fingers and your toes are phalanges. And I always like to go phalanges. And you got to say it that way, otherwise it doesn't work. Now, your digits or fingers are digital or phalanges, but your thumb and your big toe have special names. Your thumb is the pollex, and your big toe, which they don't have labeled down here, is the hallux. Now you might be wondering why there's some different terms between your list and this picture. Every book has slightly different lists. Um, every class probably requires different lists. And probably one of the most annoying things you're going to find about learning anatomy and physiology is there's probably three or four names for every part of your body. So the ones that I'm posting online and the ones that I talk about during the lectures are the ones that I'm going to ask you to know. So I'm going to hold you accountable to those. All right, so we've covered the arm and the hand. Um, we've got our abdominal, so your abdomen. Right around your belly button is umbilical. Pelvic is right below that. And then pubic is lower than that. So I always say if you're trying to find your pelvic region, you're trying to actually find the pelvic bones or uh, the pubic bone, sorry, where the two pubic bones come together in the front and form a joint called the pubic symphysis that flexes during childbirth. So you just find the umbilicus, kind of work your way down, you've got pelvic, pelvic, and then when you kind of hit that awkward point, you've probably found the pelvic or the pubic bone. Now pubic is important because you're actually on the bone there, and so that's a reference point that you can use for stabilizing the pelvic girdle and manipulating the leg and manipulating the hip joint. Now, this little area right here, inguinal, is right kind of where the crease is if you flex your leg. So if he flexes his hip and kind of pulls his hip up this direction, he's going to flex right there. And that's your inguinal region. Now, that's particularly important clinically because Individuals with testes are more likely to have inguinal hernias than individuals who do not have testes. And let me show you why. So the testes, in order to be functional and produce functional sperm in large enough quantities, they need to be outside the abdominal cavity out here in the scrotum where they can be kept a little bit cooler than the rest of the body. Otherwise, they don't produce good sperm or not enough of them and they don't function very well. The problem is, is that evolutionarily, our testes start way up here near the kidneys. So they're basically just behind the abdominal cavity, way up in the back, and then during development, they move down, exiting 
through that abdominal cavity, kind of creating a hole in that abdominal cavity for the spermatic cord, which includes blood vessels and nerves that go, and the vas deferens that go out to the testes. That little hole in the inguinal area, it's called the inguinal canal, and is basically a weak point. So if I'm applying some kind of pressure in on my abdomen, let's say I'm doing exercises where I'm tightening up my abs really hard, or think of a baby straining to go to the bathroom, when I increase pressure in here, that can potentially push intestines out through that little inguinal canal, and you have an inguinal hernia. Now, the reason I said this is evolutionary is because if we look back at fish, for example, fish are cold-blooded. They keep their testes up here kind of within or just behind the abdominal cavity to keep them warm enough because they're cold-blooded animals, so they try to keep it a little bit warmer than that cold water around them. But as soon as animals developed internal body heat generation, so they became warm-blooded animals, then these were too hot, so they weren't going to work. So they have to pass out in order to stay cooler. All right, so let's go back here. So that's a long story for just learning inguinal. All right, on our back, um, the entire back is dorsal. Right down the spine would be vertebral. Your low back is lumbar. Think lumbar support in your chair. Your buttocks are gluteal in reference to the gluteus maximus muscle that is there. Um, the We're not going to get into perineal. We're going to think of just structures for now that you can easily see on a person, even if they're clothed. Um, as we went down the leg, the front of the thigh, we said, was femoral. The front of the knee is where your patella is, your kneecap, so that's patellar. But the back of your knee is has a different name. That's popliteal. So when you have this big femoral artery coming down the leg, it's going to branch, and you're going to have branches that go across the front of the knee, and those are going to be patellar arteries, and you're going to have ones in the back of the knee, and those are going to be popliteal arteries. The front of your calf is crural, crural, and the back of your calf is sural. So those are really similar. It might be really easy to mix up. Here's an easy way to remember it. Just think if you're crawling, you're crawling on the crural side of your calf. Your ankle here, here, would be tarsal in reference to the tarsal bones. Your whole foot is pedal or pes. I always like to remember pedal or I just think pedal because I pedal a bike with my feet. We already mentioned that your big toe is the hallux. Remember your thumb was the pollux. Your heel is the calcaneal because of the calcaneous bone that makes up the heel. And the bottom of your foot is plantar. So think plantar warts on the bottom of your foot. All right, so that's the primary structures that are on your list up on um, e-learning for the outcomes and objectives. So let's see if we can apply a few of those to actual body parts. So what I would suggest you do is just kind of pause. Um, I'll number these real quick for you, and then I want you to pause the video and take it like it's a quiz, see if you can name them, see how close you can get, and then come back and um, see how you did. So if we just kind of number these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go ahead and pause the video, and then come back and we'll name them. All right, so number one is the back of the elbow. So that's going to be the olecranal or cubital. Number two is the back of his calf. So remember, we crawl on the crural side, so this is sural. The bottom of the foot is where you get plantar warts. So that's plantar. His back is dorsal. His low back here is lumbar. This would be his buttocks, so this would be gluteal. Back of his knee is just fun to say. It's the popliteal um, region. And his heel is 
calcaneal. All right, let's look at a few more. So let's number these one, two, three, four, and five. And again, pause the video and then see if you can name those. And of course you can come back and do this for practice later. So number one is his, oops, I'm gonna go back here. Number one is his upper arm. So that is brachial. Let's pick a different color and see if it shows up better. Number two is the inside of his hand. Oh, we did mention that before. This is the palm of your hand. So this region is palmar. Palmer, I know we missed one. His mouth is oral. This region of his chest, you could have said thoracic for his whole chest or sternal if you were being more specific. Can't quite see that sternal. And inside the elbow would be anti cubital. Let's do a couple more. All right, so let's get a different color pen here that will show up better. So we've got one, two, three, four. five, six, and seven. Go ahead and pause the video and then come back and we'll name them. So her forehead is frontal, her nose, nasal, her eye, orbital, her ear, you put otic solutions in the ear. This makes you think of Johnny Depp. I did resist the urge to put up a picture of Johnny Depp, although I was tempted, it would be buccal or buccal. The neck is cervical. And the chin is mental. I think I've got one or two more here. So let's just move this out of the way. Pop you in the corner. All right, so we've got one. All right, so we've got one up here, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the whole hand, eight, nine, and ten. All right, go ahead and pause the video and come back and check yourself. So number one is specifically pointing to the thumb, so that would be the pollux. Number two is pointing to the wrist, so that would be carpal. Three is the forearm, so right here, so then that is the antibrachial. Four is the big toe, I was trying to point to the big toe, so that would be the hallux. The knee, patellar. The armpit, axillary, the whole hand, manual. Uh, eight is the back of the calf, so that is sural. Nine is the front, so that is curl, because remember we crawl on the curl side. And my ankle is tarsal. All right, so let's try these here. We've got one, two, three, and four. Go ahead and pause the video. Try to answer those or name them and then come back. So number one, we're looking actually at the breast. So that is mammary. Males have mammaries as well. They just don't typically produce milk. Uh, number two, kind of this whole region here would be abdominal. Number three is right around the belly button, so that would be umbilical. And four is the upper leg, so that is femoral. Two more. I just personally love the faces that divers make, so here we go. My daughter just started diving last year, and I'm a little bit terrified. All right, so his whole head 
is cephalic, and his whole foot is pes or pedal. I think we have one last one. What is this area right here and here, right here and here, where uh, we kind of crease the leg? That is, of course, where you might get an inguinal hernia. All right, so do practice. Write it out lots of times so that you get the spelling down, and it really is just repetition, repetition. Now, I just want to show you one thing here. If you go over to the e-learning site, um, you can see that under, let's actually look at this as a student real quick, so it'll look like what you will see. So when you go into your e-learning site and you go into content, which is where you're going to find most of the things that you need this semester, you're going to go into this week's module and you'll notice there is a Kahoot review challenge. So once you feel like you've practiced a lot and you're getting it down, then I recommend going to this Kahoot challenge and kind of testing yourself. So it's kind of a fun game that you can play just to reinforce. Um, there are also some study resources here. Right now, uh, what I have for this module is are some quizlets that can help you practice terms and homeostasis.